Zoom the recording. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Mary Ambach. Thank you for joining us for this month's webinar. Uh, and thank you for joining us during your lunchtime to learn something new. Uh, you have a, a whole panelist of participants today, and you're in for a treat. Everybody's here. Our guest speaker, Darren Mellinson, is our uh, concierge physical therapist, and he will be presenting uh, with the topic of physical therapy in regenerative medicine. He will be talking about exercises, therapeutic rehab, physical activity, and all the things that you need to know and you want to know has been asking us uh, with regards to how to optimize your outcome after a regenerative procedure and how to uh, properly exercise after your treatments. Um, after his presentation, we're going to have a question and answer session. And all the doctors of San Diego Orthobiologics Medical Group are here. Mm -hmm. Dr. Rogers is here. Dr. Muriel Diaz is here. And our new physician, Dr. Ed Evangelista, is also here to join us. So I'm going to have Dr. Rogers uh, talk a little bit about our practice and uh, our physicians uh, before we begin. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Ambach. And um, it's, rare, it's rare to get four doctors and a physical therapist all in the same place at the same time. So this is kind of an um, a amazing feat, even though we had a slow start. So here we are. Um, I don't want to delay things too long, but long story short, as a doctor, as a physical therapist, we'll always tell you how important it is. Everybody knows how important it is uh, that we exercise regularly. It's necessary for all human beings to stay healthy throughout your lifespan. We also know that there are injuries that occur uh, that can interfere with that plan. And that's why you've got us. Um, we've all been injured ourselves. We know it's not fun to be injured, not be able to do the things you love to do. And that's why we come to work every day is to help people keep doing that. Uh, bad things happen to you when you stop exercising. You get deconditioned. Your muscles start to shrink. Your tendons and ligaments start to get tight. Your joints get stiff and sore. You lose sleep and you're generally cranky to be around. So we wanna help you get through that. Um, even though we're really thrilled that uh, we can offer new therapies that I'm convinced will be the standard of care in the future, but we're, we're pushing forward to make it available now using cell-based therapies such as PRP, adipose, bone marrow stem cells to help heal tissue. It's critical that you also get that rehabilitation after these treatments. That is part of the total package. And it's a little different than traditional physical therapy as you're about to hear from Darren. So without much delay here, if Darren's ready to go, I want him to talk to you a little bit about how we like to rehab our patients after uh, treatment so that we can restore your conditioning, restore your flexibility, restore your strength and get you back to doing those things you need to do. Chris, you want to introduce Ed quickly here? Oh, I thought you had. Yeah, so we're very pleased to have with us. Um, I don't know how you're looking on this Hollywood Squares thing here, but <laughs> for me, Dr. Evangelis is right there. Oh, is he over there? <laughs> and uh, here he is. He's an old guy, not quite as old as me, but he's been doing this for what? How long, Ed? 21 years? Oh, you're, oh, muted. you're muted. Oh, well, you're not going to get to hear from Ed yet. Uh, maybe Dr. Diaz can unmute him. I, I there unmute him. There 22 you years. 22. Sorry, I didn't mean to shortchange you there by a year. Uh, uh, board certified in physical medicine, as are all the other doctors. Uh, fellowship trained in um, sports medicine and uh, one other. Sports and spine. Sports and spine medicine. So a lot brings a lot of experience. He has a lot of experience with regenerative medicine as well. And he and I'll speak for you. You he wanted to join a team that was like minded. So he's now on our team. Uh, to help provide these services to, to our patients. So we're really pleased and excited to have you on board. Thanks, Welcome glad to be Ed. here. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna share my screen with everybody so we can start our presentation. All right, Darren, take it away. Okay, thanks for the introduction. Uh, real quick first, anyone that's signed in and sees your name under me, just log out and go back in through the SDOMG website and um, you'll come in as a participant. That was my oversight. 
So physical therapy and regenerative medicine. So we have had a collaboration with the doctors here at SDOMG for the past about a little over a year, um, developed from a much longer lasting relationship. And I think that's based on the kind of care that, um, that we're able to provide. So I'm the director of North County Business Development and the clinical therapist for Oceanside. Uh, at RISE Physical Therapy, we treat one-on-one -on -one therapy for one hour, and that's the same therapist each time. And because of that, we've been able to manage a very consistent quality of care. Bringing that to SDOMG, we've been able to work with the doctors to develop a, a comprehensive program that they've really driven to make sure that there's a safe return to functional activities and fill in this big space that was never here before. It's pretty amazing. Uh, that's what we're going to go into for this presentation. So that's, I think, the we can go to the next slide. Um, I've been in the industry for about the same time as Dr. Evangelista, about 22 years. Uh, I was trained in Holland, went to school at undergrad at NC State. So I just found an amazing program over there that was very manually based, um, but started out my whole uh, life and career here in the States. Uh, orthopedic certified specialist. I'm, my passion's always been sports, medicine, and rehab. I was in soccer, surfing, lacrosse uh, since a small kid, and then treated athletes and dancers and uh, weekend warriors since then. So that's where the strength and conditioning certification came in. It really helps to supplement a sports-based rehab for the orthopedics. And then certified applied functional science, that's something I learned here at RISE. Um, it's a very, as it says, functionally based. We don't do a lot of exercises lying on a table and extending a limb. They're all based on squatting, kneeling, bending, twisting exercises uh, with a progressive load so that it's a safe return to joint function, soft tissue function, and just general daily activities. Uh, we can do the next slide. So just to recap, RISE Physical Therapy, we've developed this program over the last couple of years with the doctors here, driven mainly by uh, Dr. Rogers and Dr. Ambach specifically, to fill in a space that used to be just PT or surgery. It either PT worked or it didn't work. There's too much damage and there's nothing else we could do. So guess what? Now you get to go do surgery. Now we have this platform that fills in this space using regenerative medicine to rebuild some of these tissues so that not only you're getting function back, but now since we stabilize joints or limit the amount of shear forces or basically injury forces in those areas, your recovery and the ability to possibly avoid surgery is significantly improved. The next slide. So what we really want to focus on here is um, why do you want to do concierge physical therapy? This is really based on why do we want to do physical therapy to start with, right? So you can come out of a treatment saying, okay, I feel great. There's not a lot of pain. Maybe you came in without a lot of pain and think, okay, so now I've got this magic bullet, but the tissue's not healed and you may have built in some compensation movements or patterns that are going to continue to progress. So you're setting yourself up for these things to come back. I've got a couple of case studies that'll be coming up um, specifically targeting that. One is about a lady with a big toe injury that came in that has some hip and spinal things that are going on. Without addressing those, she could have gone down the same spiral and become uh, worse uh, in the long term. So concierge therapy, our program is developed here. Concierge just means that we have very, very specific care tailored to you as you come into SDOMG, San Diego Orthobiologics for Regenerative Medicine. Um, the idea is to apply safe, targeted, customized tissue stresses so that we're allowing proper functional activity to come back in a very graded fashion with supervision from the doctors, uh, direct access to the doctors if we have any issues. There's been several times where the patient has been in and something's come up and we've been able to walk right up the hall and resolve the issue or maybe just do a, a much sooner follow-up visit than would have been um, able in the past. That's been a really nice uh, addition to what their treatment is. And then in the long term, all the doctors here are following and tracking every joint, every soft tissue, every type of treatment they're having and finding what those outcomes are. It started off with uh, specifically just knees and it's progressed on to 
small digits in the fingers, neck, shoulders, ankles, um, the whole gamut of everything. But each of those areas are being tracked either as a whole, how do we respond to regenerative medicine? How do we respond to one type of those medicine um, or which joint and body part and which age group and which uh, gender? So it's, it's really amazing to see um, plus very supportive for me to be able to find out, get an optimal outcome, because we've got these doctors here that say, well, this worked for this, and these are what's working for that. Um, and we've got this right up here in the hall. Uh, next paragraph or next slide. So I guess first thing to recover, most of the people, first things to cover, uh, most of you people already know what regenerative medicine is, because you're here seeing the doctor's uh, it's a non-invasive, non-surgical care for damaged tissues. What does that mean? We're using science in your own tissues to attract stem cells or base cells that are going to re-repair these areas or bring nutrition and chemicals so that will speed up the healing process. Um, bef with this in mind, we're able to start to address soft tissue injuries or dysfunctions without maybe needing to think, okay, maybe we're gonna to have to get a joint replacement instead. And so traditional physical therapy from regenerative physical therapy, that's what we're gonna get into now. There's, there's a definite change. Our baseline patterns in the past were just restoring function and functional movement patterns. With regenerative tissue, we have to promote a better healing environment. So lower loads, different allow different amounts of shear and just promotion of functional activity still allowing those uh, very vulnerable areas and tissue areas to heal better. Next slide. So generally our physical therapy is based on these tenants and specifically in here, we've modified those so that it becomes uh, even a more customized approach. So therapeutic load and stress, this is what we just talked about. I don't want to be putting a full-on lunge into a newly damaged knee or newly treated knee and stirring up all the cells and scraping them back off. So we want to allow therapeutic load. I mean, we want to be able to put enough stress and tolerance into these joints while allowing them to continue to bloom and heal. Uh, flexibility and range of motion is the second most important thing after pain management by increasing range of motion specifically, we can actually manage pain. Uh, we're also going to reintroduce different simulation activities that'll get them back to their normal daily function. Uh, neuromuscular control, control or stability, this is based on the stabilizing or the strengthening of the joints. Uh, similar ideas, we're going to use different ways of approaching and progressing your exercise program, so we're not going to disrupt the purpose of the exercise, also what the function of the general uh, regenerative medicine is going to be. Isometric or proprioceptive inputs, this will come a little bit later in pain management. Proprioception also for stability and uh, mobility of joints and just general daily function. And then as we progress up the line, movement patterns, we're not just going to be stepping back and forth onto a block, we're going to be able to move, be able to move up and down stairs, run, play sports, play basketball. Uh, plyometric ballistic motions, this will take us into doing things like bending, lifting, and twisting, or just being able to walk a set of stairs. From there, this is where we're starting to get into the last phases of uh, a rehabilitation, and hopefully we still have the patients with us, or we're always able to work with their trainers um, or some of their exercise programs in general to start to put sports simulation and day activities of daily living simulation exercises in. These, although being the very, very final goals of therapy, are all going to be implemented on the first day. If, if I have a volleyball player who has a shoulder injury, be doing passive range of motion and getting them into these positions where they're going to be able to serve and spike a ball, even though it's the first day. I'm obviously not going to have them loading the joint um, with uh, fast loads or a lot of weight, we're still going to be able to move into those motions. And then probably as important for the healing process is rest. Uh, being able to educate the patient on what's too much, uh, using pain as a limiting factor, but not a restrictive factor necessarily, uh, but allowing the body to be able to benefit from the regenerative medicine through rest as well as activity. 
Okay, next slide. So the different treatment approaches of regenerative PT in relation to regular physical therapy. So again, we base it on something called applied, applied functional science, which was developed by Gary Gray, uh, who's a physical therapist. He kind of has turned PT a little bit on its side by taking your general, I'm gonna walk, lie on the table and extend the knee, I'm gonna lie on my side and lift the leg, to why can't we take these people off the table and have them start walking the first day? which seems a little extreme for, say, somebody that's had a knee replacement or an ACL surgery. But what we do is we have something called a true stretch. It's a big support apparatus where we can load tissue. We can move you into uh, squatting or lunging positions, but have you 100% supported by changing either the levels and the heights or the amount of stress that we're able to generate through the feet. Uh, therapeutic exercises are going to be coordinated with your home exercise program. And we'll get into some of this in the later slides. But your exercise program is going to be one that you can repeat. It's going to be simple because honestly, they do get a little bit complicated. Your therapeutic exercises and activities in treatment are going to be much more difficult and, invo and involved than they are at home because the therapist won't be there to make these corrections and we don't need to build in compensations. They're also going to be limited to five or six because it's hard enough getting people to do exercises for physical therapy, let alone doing 12 or 15 of them. So it's usually going to be three, four, five, or six exercises, and they're going to help us build on the tenants and the progressions that we get in treatment. Uh, for me, as a manual therapist, manual therapy techniques to promote biomechanical function and really support that environment of tissue healing is going to be super important for a lot of different reasons. Um, initially, the most important would be pain management. If someone is afraid to move a shoulder, they're afraid to bend their knee, but I can take them through a functional range of motion or just a small range of motion and, and teach the body your pain receptors that it's okay to move through here. I'm not damaging anything. I can reduce the amount of stress in a joint by separating, say, some of the joint uh, tissues but being able to move almost through a full range of motion, that gives the patient confidence. It also gives the body this feeling, okay, I can do this. Now we can move on to the next position, next uh, section and start to load those joints. And then important for progression of, a safe progression, especially in regenerative medicine, is supervised progression. We would never take a patient and suddenly have them start hopping up on a bench when they can't do a step up onto a small step. So supervised progression based on the, our program development and my eye to proper technique and form so that we're gonna limit a lot of the uh, potential injury causing positions and motions that could be developed. Darren, this is great information and I'm sure yeah. our, our audience is learning a lot uh, just from the first few slides. I just wanted to remind everybody who's attending, there is a chat button and a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So if you do have questions while listening to Darren speak uh, about his topic, feel free to type in your questions. And at the end of the presentation, we can go over those questions for you. And then speaking to those tenants, so we, I do provide that therapy here in the house, but we have a number of clinics around San Diego at Rise Physical Therapy. And we've taught and teach all of our therapists specifically how to manage uh, regenerative medicine patients, because honestly, we do get a lot from them all over the county, uh, partly because they don't all live in Carlsbad. Some of them do live in El Cajon or Chula Vista or down in Point Loma. So it's important that we're not just providing that care here, but it's a, it's important to know that that program is available in all the clinics. So our approach to physical therapy kind of covers um, what's coming up next here. So this picture here, uh, a lot of these photographs are taken in our clinic. This is what we call a true stretch. This picture specifically allows us to one, increase the range of motion in this person's knee. He can use 50%, 100% of his load bearing through his hands to eliminate stress in the knee. Uh, if he's afraid, afraid to bend and twist into a lunge to the ground, he can place his foot up on the platform. Now we're eliminating loading stress. We're eliminating shearing stress. We're eliminating the need for ba dynamic balance because he can hold on to both sides. Uh, 
the promotion, the progression of the activities, again, are based on the three priorities, which is pain management, restoring the range of motion, and then restoring strength and stability so that they have proper daily function. Uh, next paragraph, next slide. So our first tenant is gonna be pain management. Uh, there's a lot of ways to go about this. Obviously, they're gonna be coming in um, with possibly medications or straps or braces. Uh, we use what we can do as far as manual therapy and exercise to allow a quicker recovery in, uh, to motion and to function without the need for as much of the external supports. So reduction in sensory input, what this basically means is we're trying to manipulate the central nervous system so that what used to be a pain sensation is no longer a pain sensation. One thing is passive range of motion. The sensation of skin touch or um, joint motion going into the central nervous system, once it's applied without pain, that your body will start to accommodate and shut those areas down. So it will reduce the amount of input and output of pain sensation so that we can do the motions better and easier and you can start to load the joints because you will be eliminating one of those distractors. Assisted range of motion as a precursor to active range of motion. So I will be doing the motion for you. We can limit the amount of shear stress. I can distract the joint to make it more open. Then we progress into assisted or active assisted range of motions where you're actually incorporating and activating those muscles. Again, moving into progressive uh, resisted activities. I can go through a range of motion now. Okay, so now I start to load it. I can do an external load by using my hands or using weight. I can do a more of an intrinsic or internal load by adding a stretch or a lunge exercise where I'm just gonna load the joint and allow the muscles to do what they need to do to stabilize you. Again, use the use of our true stretch machine or a true stretch apparatus allows us to accommodate for a significant reduction in weight transfer. So I can hold on to the sides of these bars and I'm not gonna put all the weight into my knee, but I can load it just like I'm walking. And then the final thing would be edema control. And this goes back to a lot of the manual therapy techniques, massage, effleurage, and just getting some muscle pump going. So pain management, a very important starting point to allow us to get some biomechanical improvement before we start to get functional motion. Okay, so that would be the next step. Range of motion. Um, one of the important things to consider right after treatment. So one of the things, one of the rules, the instructions after a uh, procedure is to very little or no exercise, a little bit of walking if it's a lower limb, a little to upper, little upper extremity exercise, except we want you to maintain range of motion. We don't want it hit soft tissue adhesions occurring. We don't want limitation or contractures happening where we have to break through some of these um, soft tissue restrictions uh, before we can start to move into proper exercise programs. So that includes active and active assisted joint motions. That means you're doing the activity or um, I'm helping you do the activity. Utilizing natural joint motion in a therapeutic range. Okay, that's what this picture is showing. Um, and I'll go into that in a second, as far as moving through loaded and un unloaded progressions. So next thing, let's just look at this picture. It seems pretty simple. This patient is stepping onto a stair and seems to be loading about 50%. So starting from the top, you see her hips slightly internally rotated, the knees about cent central and midline, but the toes internally rotated. We can do several different things or infer several things from this. We can deload the outside of the knee or compress the inside of the knee if we're trying to protect the lateral collateral or maybe start to strain the medial collateral. The toes internally rotating, making the hip muscles and the stabilizers a little bit longer, so they have to work harder. This is going to be something that's going to promote a bit more hip stability, but also the tolerance for the joint to take some torsion in the knee, let's say. We move to the other side. There's load tolerance to the standing leg and balance assistance. So from this one quick snapshot, we've got balance and loading range of motion on the left side. And we've got knee flexion, in hip internal rotation, and ankle motion on the right side. Not even to mention that she's stepping onto a seven-inch step. That seven-inch step could eliminate 100% of the 
tran weight transfer load if she's just going to toe tap, or is that say up to 50%? So she can load forward as if she's going to step up, but she has the control on okay, where's my pain limitation. I'm going to stop right before that. I'm going to create therapeutic stress to my meniscus, the joint lines, the soft tissues that are properly, probably in, involved, um, and start to develop a, a safe walking pattern and a safe stair climbing pattern. So just simply from this one picture, we can infer a whole lot of information as far as joint and soft tissue extensibility. And if you can see right over her left shoulder, our cage is over there. So now I can eliminate uh, loading stress 100% and just work on passive range of motion. Next. And then our final, uh, but probably our most important phase of exercise is promotion of static and dynamic stability. Static stability is this to be able, the ability to tolerate load standing equally on both feet or bending down to pick up some groceries. Our dynamic stability would be being able to step to the side, uh, jump forward to do a, a jump shot in basketball, play hockey, um, or just pick up your kids. So promotion of static and dynamic stability comes on a lot of different phases. We can start in the true stretch by increasing load, um, stress loads, or as this person is here, she he is on a BOSU ball. It's creating a lot of external challenges to his balance. He's got to stabilize the ankle, hip, and knee. But you also see the left knee is bent. Maybe he has a knee uh, injury. So we're starting to do active range of motion, but because of the load that he's had on his other side and the proprioceptive education that goes through your system, this load on the right side can promote better stability on the left once he's able to tolerate that uh, stress. So promotion of static dynamic stability, this is what brings us back to being able to get back to our, what we call our prior functional level of activity. And then in the end phases, we're gonna introduce goal-oriented activities of daily living or sports sim. This is one of our therapists who's a hockey player. So maybe he had a shoulder injury. So we want to be able to get him to take that left arm and swing it back so he can go for a slap shot. We're loading it with a 14 pound weight shared between two hands. He's half kneeling. So we're going to eliminate the whole bottom half as far as range of motion. If I, we can lock one area to make the other area a little bit more mobile. If I have him holding on to two bars with his hands, we can... Uh, work on functionally increasing lumbar range of motion or hip motion without it transferring to the upper body. But for this position, he's got some balance training, loading through the right hip, using an un uneven surface, a uh, little bit of hip flexor stretching on the right side, and that trunk rotation, increasing some of the uh, functional stretch throughout the whole body. And this may be just the beginning of a diagonal patterning uh, for ballistic stability. Maybe he has to jump out of here or do a slap shot from that position. Now we're putting in this, the sports simulated activities all under a very controlled and supervised environment, which we can tweak to make this much harder or much lighter, more range of motion, more stability, or a combination of more mobility and stability, whatever's needed. And so outcomes, this is always a very important part of how and when we treat. Uh, again, this is a very new industry working between conservative physical therapy and doing uh, surgical rehab. So it's important that we do follow our outcomes. Um, we can't always follow the same healing timeline that we would in the past. So again, very, very basic is about six weeks for bones, about three months for soft tissue or muscles. Um, and possibly longer up to six months for joints. We're working on a different timeline because of the age, the chronicity, the, uh, the acuteness of the trauma. So with each visit, with each initial evaluation, we're going to assess that. What type of therapeutic stress can we add without causing a dysfunction or a um, emotion that we don't want or pain? Progressing that activity on a daily basis including with the home exercise program so that we're continually continually doing an efficient progression and getting them back to their activities as soon as possible. Uh, very important thing to consider with this is because of the lack of post-surgical pain with a regenerative medicine procedure, 
we have to a lot of times rein back some of our very, very uh, active patients because they're using pain as their guideline. I'm great now. I don't feel any pain. Swelling's gone down, you know, part of the regenerative process, but sometimes we have to be very mindful about what is the progressive load that this, this specific case can tolerate. This will always come into our uh, patient outcomes and then the satisfaction surveys. Uh, this one really I put in because the knee was the first one to be tracked. Uh, be very brief again. There were some surveys done from post-surgical knees and people with PRP. And after two years, the PRP outcomes were higher than the surgical outcomes as far as the patient satisfaction. And these are things that the doctors can talk on a little bit later if you have questions with. Next slide. Okay, so that is kind of in a nutshell what can, uh, concierge physical therapy covers and what our regular physical therapy, one of our clinics would cover. So if you, if and when you finally decide to come in or if you've had your treatment and the doctor is highly recommending that this is the best way for you to become uh, optimally fit, then the, this is what you can expect. So our initial evaluation will be based on a functional assessment with baseline measures. That just means how, move, how far can I move your limb? How much strength do you have? What causes pain? What's the initial injury? And what do we think are our primary um, functional deficits? We're gonna set realistic goals from there based on those same tenants. What's the age? What's the timeline? How severe is the injury? What did the doctor tell me not to do this time? Um, maybe they've seen this history and we need to rein the patient in a little bit more or let them go a little bit further. So these are some of the discussions I'll have with the doctors uh, just to make it a little bit more of a, an easy path for that patient. Our predicted progression um, kind of all lumped into that same idea of setting the really realistic goals and then customizing that program. Um, that is, I think, the biggest difference between going somewhere and getting your recipe list of exercises for a knee and your recipe list of exercises for a shoulder. We have to take into account how long has this person had this injury? What's the severity of that injury? Timeline um, is an acute injury. Did they just sprain their ankle a few weeks ago? Have they been playing pickleball for 25 years and it's been hurting them for 12? Right, so customizing that program so we can incorporate uh, a good home exercise program and a proper manual approach to make sure that we're restoring not only function to the, the affected joint or the affected limb or tissue, but to the whole body so that we're not going to cause the same thing to happen on the other side. Just a quick comment here, Chris, we should move uh, Darren's gym to the Carlsbad Beach, and I bet you everybody will sign up for post-rehab. As, as long as it's not January. Physical therapy. So, <laughs> can, I, can I just make a quick comment, Darren? Um, yes. I think everyone appreciates um, what you've just presented here is a very thoughtful approach to physical therapy. Mm -hmm. I will tell you, um, I have been working with physical therapists since 1984, so almost 40 years. And the and like you, some of the best therapists that I've met over those years have this mindset, and that is, um, and we know that and patients who've been through physical therapy know this. There is a fine line between pushing your body to becoming stronger, more flexible, more functional, and setting you back with an injury or a flare up in pain. And sometimes a little pain is necessary to make a long term gain, but but knowing that is key. And that's why I think what we've created here in the clinic is so critical where we have the physicians who know what you look like on the inside. We have your MRI, we have your x-ray, we have your ultrasound. Even though you may have a tear in your meniscus that isn't causing symptoms, we know it's there. And then we can inform and work with you to progress the patient in a way that minimizes the risk of those flare-ups, but maximizes the functional outcome uh, that that patient is trying to achieve. And I think I think that's something that doesn't get said enough, that this really is an art. And all our physical therapists are artists and consultants with physicians. And the, the concept that a physician can give the patient a cookie cutter approach and say, do these 10 exercises after your back pain, or could watch a YouTube video, or that the surgeon can give the physical therapist a cookie cutter approach after undergoing major surgery 
is completely flawed and we don't get as good an outcome as having that one-on-one -on -one relationship that you have with the patient, fully understanding that patient and working with them as a partner through this process. So I just wanted to, get, I just wanted to share my perspective on the importance of what you just outlined for us. Thank you. We, we have a lot of physical therapists that are uh, joining us in this webinar, and I'm sure, Chris, they can appreciate what you just said, the, the real importance of, of working together to collaborate on the patient's outcomes is really key. Yeah. And let's face it, things can change, right? As you're going through this program that you're just about to see, week one, week two, week three, patients don't always follow the, the, the normal progression of healing and being able to adjust on the fly is also another benefit of having this concierge approach. So I didn't realize you weren't done think, your slides. Hmm? <laughs> I didn't realize. I think uh, what's been very helpful too is in this collaboration that every, all of the doctors at SDUMG have been very open to any ideas, any input that I've had um, and really implemented it into the program. So I, did, I feel like I definitely have as, as much of a, a say and impact in how this is being uh, promoted and driven as the doctors themselves. And sometimes that's not always the case when you have us DPTs um, hanging out with, with MDs, right? It doesn't always come off that. that yeah. so I see, it's, a, it's a great group of people to work with. It, it should be the way that we have. This is, this is, you know, ultimately we have to serve the patient. So this mm -hmm. is, this is how we get it done. Anyway, you have, you have so, some more, some more to share with us. Mm -hmm. right, so the, what I'm going to do, we move on to the next part of the questions. We had a lot of different questions about, um, okay, when do, when do I start working out again? What type of a timeline am I looking at? Um, Considering you know soft tissue healing processes, we're kind of breaking it down into uh, these phases right here. So the first week, uh, basically, is don't go back to doing your rehab exercises yet. Range of motion exercises, gentle active stretching to allow the joint and soft tissue to basically take in those new cells that are there, uh, have them start to kind of marinate in there, and have their uh, process start working, and setting down that matrix so we're not disrupting it. So a little bit of activity, but lack of activity could be just as detrimental. We don't want any restrictions um, starting up and then we have to break through those. After the second week, we'll see you in physical therapy. Um, some of you will have come in already, had pre-rehab, and then we're gonna do post-treatment uh, rehab. But we start to load, we start to begin to add these loading processes in. We do want tissues to be stressed. We do want joints to be mobilized. We do want muscles to contract, but we don't want them to do it at, at maximal level right now. We just want the activity to be there. And I think shear stresses is the big word. That's my key word, at least, is we want to be able to load the joint, but we don't want to create a lot of torsional shear that's going to disrupt tissues and cells that are laying down. We're talking about a microscopic level, you could put some pressure on them. You just shouldn't be scraping them off with a with a knife, right? Uh, weeks three through 12, now we're gonna be getting back into more functional activities. If they're gonna be a volleyball player, maybe we add side lunges. Maybe we do side lunges to a step so we're not doing as much load into the injured joint. Uh, over at activities, active and active resist, assistive and resisted for golfers or tennis players um, or the new uh, paddle ballers and, and pickleball. But progressive return for those levels of activity, again, very, very supervised, not just treatment to treatment, but every minute. As we see you do an exercise, we're going to tweak some things, make sure the form is correct. If there's a dysfunction, we're going to look at why is that dysfunction? It may be not coming from the ankle. It could be coming from the opposite hip. So we want to make sure that all those pieces are working together. And then your timeline is as you come out, we'll be checking back in with your doctor at six weeks for a follow-up. They may or may not do another ultrasound to check how much tissue healing is. Much more likely at week 12, make sure that you're following your protocol. The PT is doing what he's supposed to be doing. Your gains are being met. And most importantly, in regenerative medicine, that those tissues are actually healing. They're responding to the, um, the cell matrix. Next slide. Okay, so we'll go to the case studies. Um, I'm gonna be very brief with these because of time. Basically, I put these in because of the questions. It's like, okay, if I've got a, a, an ankle injury, 
can I be going back in three months? Well, it's based on a lot of different things. And I'll go through these three cases and then we'll talk about it. Um, so Sandy, Sandy came in with a big toe arthritis. She had a uh, procedure done. She was going, why do I need to come to PT? It's my big toe. I kind of, I'm like, okay, it's your big toe. What am I going to do with that? So she walks in and I find out she's a sailor and she sails barefoot. Okay. So now we've got to wonder, okay, can she load that toe? So on a very micro level, I mean, working on joint mobilization and functional loading in the toe. That wasn't her problem. She was starting to get knee and hip problems because she was limping for so long off that foot. Her biggest dysfunction was a hip instability. She couldn't stabilize through the hip. Her knee was starting to internally rotate and was putting more stress in that big toe than necessary. So we ended up starting to work on lower back, hip, all the way down to the toe progression so that she could just walk right. John, he came in with both knees and both ankles. Uh, moderate swelling in both ankles. Right knee was worse than his left, and he was a golfer. He golfed up till the week before he did his procedure. Um, came limping in. He was uh, pretty kind of penguin footing. And that was going to be on the other side of it. It's like, okay, what are we going to do with this? It's super swollen. There's a long, long history of arthritis and it's in every major joint in his lower extremities. So we had to dial it back and start to get into pain management, edema control first, and then range of motion. I really wasn't interested in his strength or functional stability at that point. He could walk. That was great for me. He wanted the golf immediately, told him to wait a little bit. We've got to work on getting your hips and lower back motion first, and actually some of his thoracic, because that was loading his hip, then his knee, then his ankle. On the reverse of that, I had to do pain management on his ankles, then his knees, then his back, right? So we had to go at it from two parts. So my manual mind was working one way, and my strength and conditioning mind was working the other way, and we met in the middle, we made this nice little program out. Uh, let's see the last slide. Oh yeah, Jane. So Jane, last one is a pickleball player. She's been playing for a while, limping around for about six months. Um, heel pain came in, found out she had a pretty good sized tear in the Achilles tendon. I saw her with, I think it was Dr. Rogers at her three month visit. And she's like, my pain is still the same. And she's like, we asked, what have you been doing? Well, I've been playing pickleball three days a week. Like, okay. We weren't quite supposed to do that, but let's see what happened. We take the ultrasound, take a view, and her, her tissue healing was 75% better. This is with, I would say, an um, overload to that joint, but it was her prior level of function. So her pain level remained the same. Her activity level remained the same. Her injury level continued to improve. So again, working with and against pain isn't always necessarily the, the primary focus because her functional level superseded all of that, but she had enough healing process occurring that if she was able to tolerate that pain and she wasn't getting any worse, um, we, could, we could kind of maybe dial her back to two days a week, uh, but accept the fact that she's doing it three days a week and still making progress. So that goes on the whole scope of things. The person with the big toe issue was pretty fully functional, but didn't realize the minor dysfunctions that could have spiraled into something a little bit worse um, or made that toe pain come back. The second guy with severe uh, progressive and chronic injuries in several different joints that within four weeks was playing golf once a week able to tolerate the pain, wasn't causing damage, but we had increased range of motion and functional tolerance and loading and rotation in those positions that he could do that, but just not at the level he was before. And he's still in the process for that. And then there's Jane here, who's basically blasting through everything at 100% and continues to heal. And the positive part of this healing process is that we know that she's gonna to continue to heal for up to two years before we have to do something else. And if she decides to, there's always the possibility of doing a booster shot in the middle. And then we've got us physical therapists kind of keeping control of what's going on and making sure we can kind of pick the pieces. Um, again, just kind of indicated and educated throughout our whole company is that our functional level is the primary goal based on a safe return with, um, you know, with optimal load without overloading the joints and tendons. 
Uh, what's the next paragraph? Okay, so that's that's really the, the message is that less is more, let your body heal. This is not magic. It seems like magic. It's an amazing thing that wasn't here 20 years ago. I would work on somebody for 15 weeks, way too long, and oh, too much damage, nothing else to do. Not really need for surgery, but you're not getting any better, so you might as well get it now before they don't let you or before whatever. Now we've got this huge platform to be able to now return people to their uh, prior level activities or to their sports or to their passions and have everything heal again. It's, it's the, you're actually buying people years and years back of their life. And I think it's important to follow it with a good, thorough, comprehensive evaluation and rehab program, or like the big toe lady that could, that could cause some other issues coming down the line. So, um, yeah, I think it's it's important thing to consider is that you can probably make it out with uh, without doing your rehab or your old PT exercises, but your outcomes are going to be so much better, and we can really prevent further problems um, by by following a good um, PT program. You're right. Thank you so much, Darren. Um, that really gives us great perspective. I just want to. Um share uh, a thought and in and, and response to some of these questions and, and I'll just remind everybody you can submit questions with the last 10 minutes that we have here we will answer how often do you get four doctors and a physical therapist in the same room so please pick our brain I think between the five of us we have over 7,000 years of experience so um, I'll just tell you that um, so one of the questions is how soon can I walk after getting PRP in my knee and again it's not you know I think our, the point you keep hearing is it's not a cookie cutter approach um, but that we have general we have general uh, guidelines. So um, everything about what we do, whether it's physical therapy, cell injection, anything in orthopedics, it's about getting you from here to here, right? Improvement. So if you start here, if you have mild arthritis in your knee, mild joint limitation, mild stability issues, mild balance issues, you're going to get there quicker, right? You're going to get back to walking quicker. If you start down here, like so many folks do, what do they do? They say, well, I waited for my pain to go away. Two years later, pain's still there. Well, I got busy. My water heater broke in my house. You know, everything else becomes a priority over your own health. If we catch you down here, it's going to take longer, and that should be expected. It's going to take longer to get you back to where you want to be. So, yeah, we have great treatments, we have great therapists, but it's not going to happen overnight if we're catching you when the when the condition has progressed to that severe state. The good news is people do get there, and we can get you more quickly here with a well thought, well, well thought out, well constructed plan, uh, treatment plan and rehab plan. So I think, I think that's healthy to know. In general, for folks, say you're 35 year old with some mild arthritis in your knee or a small meniscal tear, we do PRP in your knee. We don't stop you from walking right away. You can walk around the house, you can do stuff, but we probably wouldn't have you do a, you know, three or four mile hike out in the hills uh, until we, sh until we see evidence that you're joint can handle it. So that means um, working with your physical therapist, you know, based on how your knee is performing in the gym, we can give you a sense of what, what's less likely to flare you up. But in general, uh, after, you know, PRP and a knee for an average case, I mean, we have people back, you know, walking a half mile, a mile, two miles, uh, easily, you know, within probably six weeks uh, for, you know, a not too difficult case. For a more difficult case, it could be three months in the, in the most in the most stubborn cases, it, it could even be longer than six months. But for most people's, well, well less than that. All right. So that we'll tackle the next question here. Um, the question says, with any upper extremity tendon injuries, such as rotator cuff tendon or elbow ligament, will there be any range of motion or particular lifting precautions or restrictions that need to be adhered and enforced to ensure optimization of the injection? Um, I, I'll answer a part of this question and then I'll have you, uh, Darren, uh, put in your, your two cents in it as well. So um, we, we do have a, a particular uh, healing uh, pattern after a regenerative procedure. And although there are guidelines on how long the inflammatory phase goes or how long the proliferative phase goes or how long the uh, the remodeling phase goes, this is really very individualized. And it the, the answer is very complex because it really depends on one, how 
severe is your injury? Number two, where are you in that healing process? And number three, are there any other medical comorbidities that will, you know, modify, that needs to be modified uh, for your program? Uh, but basically, everything is thoughtfully created with regards to all these rest restrictions and also in where you are in that healing process. And, and, and every patient varies. So there, and I'll, put, I'll, I'll give you um, your answer to that as well. Yeah, I think mine's more from a functional approach to it. If you're going to be unable to move through a position without making a compensation, simple one is I go to raise my arm and suddenly my shoulder pops up. That's one limitation. That's not going to help the healing process. Um, and then pain. Um, pain isn't always a limiting factor, but especially at the beginning, right after, after the procedure or even after a surgery, if something is going to be painful, it's probably not the right direction to go in. And then for me personally, for a shoulder injury in general, I just tell people nothing overhead. Uh, shoulder height is your platform. There's nothing positive about being reaching up overhead and creating impingement pain over and over again. That's going to promote a faster healing process. So just everything below shoulder height, most of your function is down uh, from your neck down uh, as far as a, a height level. Um, so yeah, pain and just limit that range of motion. It's going to be similar to what you felt prior to the, the surgery or the procedure. Um, this is a little more specific for that time frame. Okay, next question. And everybody can chime in. Uh, in general, when can a person who just had undergone knee PRP can run again? How long has it been since you ran? So we have patients who are running on quote unquote bad knees, and that's good for the knee. And, you know, 20 years ago, we told patients, don't run on your osteoarthritic knee. That was wrong. The data now suggests that uh, being active is, is better than not being active for a lot of reasons. But um, uh, the least of which is that that tissue requires loading and unloading on a rhythmic, uh, on a regular pattern to stimulate uh, nutrition of those tissues. On the other hand, some patients um, have so much damage or have, have not achieved enough healing yet that that tissue can't tolerate the load. In general, a little inflammation is a good thing. Remember everybody, when you were 20 years old, you go to the gym or do an exercise, you'd be sore the next day. You might be sore two days, but you usually weren't sore a week or a month or three months. So too much inflammation is not a good thing. So we don't wanna, we don't wanna um, make our treatments um, less effective by introducing too much inflammation too early, but a little inflammation is okay. A little pain is okay. So a lot of times, and uh, if the question is, when can I get back to running? It, the question is, how long has it been since you ran? How much damage do you have to the joint? What other functional restrictions could we possibly address before we ask you to go back and run? You know, if you don't have normal range of motion in your hip, your knee, your ankle, we're asking your knee to do a lot more uh, than it has to do. So it's all about minimizing risk, minimizing symptoms, maximizing function. And I'm sorry we keep giving you the same answer. It depends, but it does depend. And, um, and that's why we believe that customized care is more appropriate. All right, uh, Dr. Evangelista, you want to comment on uh, just uh, spinal rehab and strengthening uh, the spine, especially in patients who's got um, deformities like scoliosis or had undergone uh, surgeries like spinal fusion? You're Hang muted. on one second. You are muted. There we go. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, core strengthening is key with uh, for spinal rehab. Uh, you can imagine if your spine is a big stick, if there's nothing supporting that, then it's going to cause a lot of undue stress on the discs, the joints, the ligaments. So uh, strengthening the core and the spinal stabilizing muscles is very important with uh, any spinal rehabilitation program. And uh, Dr. Diaz, can you uh, just comment on um, other modalities that the patients can avail of uh, while undergoing physical therapy uh, during the rehab process? There's a lot of things that patients ask us about, you know, with regards to heat, ice, tense unit, uh, shockwave therapy. So if you could just comment on other modalities that can possibly help them in their recovery. Sure. So there's a couple of things that would be a good adjunct to the treatment after PRP and rehab. 
And the good thing about having a therapist and the doctors in the same team is that they're going to let you know when you can start doing all these things. Usually we say like eyes will be helpful if you had a kind of like a flare up or a pain got a little bit worse after the injection, which it's expected with the inflammatory process that we are creating. And then after that, we have seen that heat uh, has been very helpful to improve the blood supply to the region and also to give those cells uh, even more opportunity to promote healing and uh, collagen production and increase the blood flow to that region and release those growth factors that we want in those joints or tendons. Um, that's definitely helpful. And uh, I know we uh, say we try to avoid any anti-inflammatory medications before and after the procedure. So we want to give the patient some other options. Those options will be shockwave therapy. That's a good uh, combination that we can do one week after the, uh, one or two weeks after the, the procedures. Um, and then I saw questions about um, maybe massage or, or soft tissue mobilization. That's definitely something that it will be helpful to. We usually want to wait until week three to six to start those, uh, just to give you know the benefits of the injection and um, that inflammatory process. That there are different phases of that inflammatory process that we want to happen. Uh, but by week three or six, those soft tissue man, uh, manipulation and massage can be also added to the to the treatment. That's great. Um, that we have run out of time. It's one o'clock, uh, Darren. This has been a great presentation. Uh, I will, I certainly learned a lot and, you know, there, I'm sure there's a lot of more questions and, and we're really uh, lucky to have you right next door and to collaborate and, and improve patient outcomes and patients has been really happy having you uh, in the building with us. So thank you for all your care and support to our patients. Um, any last words before we go, Darren? Uh, no, I, I agree. Thank you for having me here. I think it's, it was nice to be able to participate in this. And I mean, you guys have been great to work with. Again, it's a two-way road was it, as far as it comes to the programs goes, and I'm learning just as much. So thank you for having me here. All right. I think that's it. Thank you guys for sticking with us for a whole hour. And <laughs> uh, till next month, uh, we'll try to think of, of, of other uh, topics that are of interest to everybody. Uh, watch out for our social me social media posts and uh, email posts. And till next time, have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.